And we're going to go into the last session, topical session of the day, uh, which is again on senses. And Yohani Palazma has kindly agreed to chair this session. I'll turn it over to him. Uh, good afternoon. I thought I would say a few, few uh, personal uh, comments about the subject matter of uh, architecture and the senses, mainly because I have followed this uh, subject matter for 50 years myself, and I have been uh, at some points rather uh, strongly participating in the conversations. Today it uh, seems like a natural subject matter to be talking about architecture and the senses, but uh, uh, throughout the era of modernity it has not been much discussed. Um, it has uh, been understood I guess always that architecture is a visual art form and uh, mainly it has been theorized in, on uh, the ground of, uh, uh, of gestalt theories in, uh, in the 50s and 60s. But then uh, I myself began to feel that uh, we are somehow losing our senses in the modern world and in fact one of my very first essays in the late 1960s was entitled uh, Man Without Senses. Then as it happened also some philosophers uh, uh, began to publish books which were uh, criticisms of the visual hegemony, the hegemony of vision uh, writers, philosophers like David Michael Levin and um, uh, Martin J. Levin's book uh, Modernity and the Hegemony of Vision and um, Jay's book uh, Downcast Eyes. Uh, at the same time also uh, an interest began to emerge in uh, the role of other senses, for instance the Canadian uh, anthropologist Ashley Montague published a thick book uh, entitled Touching, where he points out uh, or suggests that uh, touch is uh, an important sense, although Aristotle had, had categorized uh, vision as the most important uh, sense and uh, touch as the lowest sense. And his argumentation was that even animals have a sense of touch, and that is why it was in such a low category. At any way, uh, Ashley Montague suggests in his book that uh, even uh, that there is a strong relationship between vision and touch, because uh, the eyes uh, develop uh, from their specializations of the skin and in, in fact uh, somewhat surprisingly we maintain uh, capacity to distinguish color in certain parts of our, our skin. Anyone can learn fairly easily to distinguish colors by, by the skin. Well, my own writings uh, and a couple of books were uh, in the vague of the uh, philosophical critique of uh, the hegemony of vision until I began to be interested in uh, the uh, collaboration and interaction of the senses uh, rather than the uh, sp uh, sp specialized and distinct roles. Particularly I was and I'm still very interested in the tactile element uh, uh, hiding in, in vision. And, uh, I think that's a very important uh, area of uh, vision for architects is to understand how we touch through the, our eyes and how that ta uh, hidden tactile experience uh, defines whether we experience pleasure or unpleasure, for instance. Another recent interest of mine has continued 
five years or so is the role of peripheral vision in architectural theory. Vision is theorized solely as focused vision. But uh, uh, in my view, by definition, when we see something in focus, we are outsiders to what we see, whereas we can become insiders only through the interaction of the focused vision and peripheral vision. But there is no, no architecture book yet that would theorize the role of uh, peripheral vision. And then I'm just uh, uh, give, giving you a, uh, uh, some kind of idea how this uh, interest uh, develops away from, from vision. Then uh, an important aspect in uh, our um, understanding of space is atmosphere or, or uh, mood. And that is, of course, something that is uh, usually multi-sensory. And since it is not an object at all, it is something that is suspended between the object and the subject. Uh, it is extremely difficult to theorize. But I would suggest that uh, it is uh, perhaps the most important um, uh, sense that uh, defines whether a space is invigorating or passivating, pleasant or un unpleasant. So I'm su suggesting that uh, the, uh, there's still a lot to be surveyed in uh, the role of uh, the senses. Uh, there are now books, a couple of books even on, on architecture and taste. And um, I, I have written about uh, the uh, oral invitation of marble, which uh, I experienced in, in here in California once entering a, a green and green uh, house. And as I was stepping through the door, there was a white uh, shining marble threshold and the invitation to kneel and touch the white marble by, with my tongue was overwhelmingly strong and I realized architecture does have also a uh, oral invitation. Well, I'll give the floor to the first presenter and uh, this afternoon we are going to talk about the senses and architecture, particularly light, smell, and sound. And the first presenters are Sachin Panda and Fred Marx. Thank you. <laughs> well, good afternoon to all of you. I'm Frederick Marx, <clears throat> and I thought I'd give you some context uh, to the people who you're going to hear right now. I happen to be an architect, and my colleague in this presentation, Sachin Panda, is a biologist. We met uh, just about two years ago, and it had to do with a panel session that was taking place for our first conference in 2012. And at that time, we were still assessing whether the language of architecture and science uh, would allow for a good conversation. And as it turned out, not only did Sachin assist me to a great degree in this educational session, but we became collaborators. Uh, there are several studies that we've been looking at over the last two years. Uh, we're going to present one of them. I hope it will delight you this late afternoon. And with that, let me begin. I, uh, just to further the context, I'm going to give you a visual tour of the subjects that we studied, and Sachin is going to concentrate on the data. The year was 1908, and David Gamble, who was an heir to the Procter & Gamble company 
Fortune and his wife, Mary, departed from where they lived full-time, Cincinnati, Ohio, where the company was located, to Pasadena, California, uh, to take residence in a new winter home that was designed by Green and Green. And we just heard uh, that architect's name mentioned in terms of their textual understandings. This particular home fell into a style called arts and crafts, which began in Great Britain some years before. It was approximately 8,200 square feet, but it was clearly of one of a kind type of architecture, and it concentrated on a variety of woods for its exterior and interior finishes, uh, that being teak and mahogany, uh, redwood, oak, and Douglas fir. Now, a half century later, uh, J. Walter Bailey, a psychologist, and his wife, Maria, uh, moved into a new residence <clears throat> in the Hollywood Hills of California. And this residence was only 1,300 square feet and one story. And you can see that to your left. But it was a principal example of, of an early attempt at prefabrication. And it had an open floor plan uh, based on a module of 10 feet by 22 feet. And each room, both private and public, had access to the outside by sliding glass walls. The way that this home um, became known as House 21 is that it participated in a program called the Case Study House Program that was developed in 1945, established by the then editor of Art and Architecture magazine. And the purpose of the program was to encourage architects to uh, create modern, low-cost prototype housing that could be duplicated. Now, these two existing buildings represent a polarity in design. In the case of the Gamble House, we have sloped roofs and we have screen casement windows throughout all of its elevations. On the other hand, with House 21, we have no penetrations in the east and west walls. In the case of the Gamble House, we have an asymmetrical floor plan. What this did was to limit the amount of light that could travel from the exterior wall to the inner portions of the home. Again, in contrast, with the Bailey House, you, um, you had light that could enter both the uh, north and south elevation and penetrate from one side to the other side of the building, of which you can see in this particular image. The Gamble House had wood and plaster <clears throat> uh, and um, I'm sorry. Um, and paper, wallpaper, for its interior finishes. And in the case of, of the uh, kitchen, which we see to the lower uh, right, sunlight came from the south. But there was an important element both to this kitchen and pantry, pantry being to the right-hand side of the, of the image. Uh, that it allowed um, the Gamble family to at least have a ribbon-like window uh, set up so that light could be entering from three locations. It should also be detailed that a kitchen of this type, particularly for the Gamble house, was basically used 
for cooking by domestics, uh, and the family would only enter for eating purposes. On the other hand, the modern kitchen of the Bailey House had light coming from three different sources, uh, not only from the windows that we saw in the previous slide, but also from an interior courtyard, which is to the back of the photographer taking this picture. In the case of the bedroom for the Gamble House, uh, the windows faced west, but there was some light penetrating from an exterior door that led to an outdoor sleeping balcony. In the case of the Bailey House, the window faced south, and you had saturated light within the entire master bedroom. The split view that we see in this case with the, the Gamble House living room uh, suggests with the lights uh, seen on the uh, left side of the image uh, that we had both west and north light um, and a little light coming from the east with an exterior door. But it was a large room as compared to the Bailey House, which was probably, oh, maybe half the size. Uh, and in this case, another southern exposure uh, with strong sunlight filtering in. And one can see that beyond the, the daylit circumstances, you had illumination by, by this time, incandescent light in the evening. Now, just as an aside, if, if you look at this 1960 color photograph, which was taken by Julius Schulman, one may suggest today that it's a good advertisement for the television show Mad Men. But the point I want to make before Sachin talks about the data um, is that what we have before us are two single family homes from two, uh, two very distinct eras. Um, that we have two landmarks, particularly as it associates itself to California. Um, we have a distinction in design, and design, uh, I mean in this case, the language of design. And we have an understanding and an appreciation and an attempt to use as much as possible all the virtues uh, of the environment within Southern California. So the question is, with these two examples, for the occupants, was there a difference in terms of their behavior and health as it applied to the quality and quantity of light. And with that, I'll allow Sachin to begin his part of the presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sachin Panda. Uh, I'm an associate professor at the Salk Institute, and my primary focus is on circadian rhythm. Almost all of you, um, when you hear the term circadian rhythm, we think of sleep, which happens sometime around 2 o'clock in the morning, and just before we wake up, a core body temperature begins to rise, a melatonin level drops as soon as we see the first ray of light, and our cortisol level begins to rise, and we have highest alertness around the middle of the day, and uh, we have better athletic performance towards the end of the day. Then as soon as the lights turn off, the melatonin level goes up, we begin to feel sleepy, core body temperature cools down, and this goes on and on. And if you think of a healthy life, that's essentially a well-orchestrated sequence of these biological events occurring at the right time of the day. And when this disruption, these circadian rhythms are disrupted, we are predisposed to chronic diseases and accelerated aging. And that's why I'm interested in how this clocks 
operate and how they're sensitive to light or how they're entrained to day-night cycle. So we know that light during the day can suppress melatonin level and can reduce sleepiness. It can synchronize circadian clock to ambient light, can improve alertness and can prevent depression. Whereas light in the evening can delay melatonin rise, so can hamper or disrupt sleep, desynchronize circadian clock, and there is increasing evidence that increased illumination can predispose to obesity and diabetes. So a few years ago, we got interested in the light sensor that does these things because many blind people can still reset their clock, and we found there is a novel type of light sensors called melanopsins, and those are actually shown in the background. There are nearly 5,000 of them in each eye, and they integrate light information over time and do quite a few things. Over the last few years, what we have also learned is this light sensing of the non image forming visual system has different threshold sensitivity. For example, we need minimum of 50 lux of light for one hour to see any effect on melatonin. 500 lux for an hour can begin to reset our clock, and around 2,000 lux seems to be the threshold for uh, alleviating seasonal, seasonal affective disorder or depression. So with this information in mind, we can ask how much light we get in a winter day in Southern California. So what we did was um, we picked a date which was almost uh, the freezing cold in <laughs> Southern California, 14th of January, and I measured light intensity throughout the day and night um, in Rancho Penisquito Canyon Preserve, AKA my backyard. <laughs> and at that time, the sunrise was around 6.50 sunset, as you can see. And what is interesting is just at the time of sunrise, there was already 390 lux light in my backyard under a tree. And uh, it raised 1,000 lux within uh, 10 minutes. And at the end of the day, at the time of sunset, there was 800 lux of light. And, at, um, and well, there was around 1,000 lux just five minutes before. And in between these two time, there are nearly nine and a half hours of light. There's more than 2,000 lux. The maximum light I got was 160,000 lux. And um, there's sufficient light, 5,000 lux. But the thing is, we, and particularly I don't live outdoor, and in fact, current cell phone use pattern has shown that on an average we spend 87% of time indoor. So that's why I got interested in how much light is present in built environment. And that's when Fred and I collaborated. And we picked up these two houses that he introduced you to. One was Gamble House. And we tested light level in between July and August. Sunrise time was 6 a.m., sunset around 7.40, around 13 and a half hours of sunlight. We put light sensors in different parts of the houses so that we can continuously monitor light level throughout 24 hours for several days. And what I'm showing you is the median light level in this house. In living room at two different locations, as you can see, the light barely went above 100 lux throughout the day, and there was only an hour when it went above 100 lux. And in the bedroom, it barely touched 100 lux very close to the window, and at uh, where the bed was located, it barely touched 100 lux. And the kitchen seemed to be the very um, dark area. We can contrast that with Bailey's house. The same sensors were uh, put at different locations. And uh, we find a completely different picture here. Uh, the median light level inside Bailey House was around 1,000 lux. And in fact, the darkest area, that is the kitchen, was around 800 lux at any time of the day. And you can see the light level. In fact, in bedroom, sometimes the light level raised 50,000 lux because of the glass door and um, very thin um, window coverings there. So now let's go back to those numbers that I introduced you to, and then maybe Kent, if I can have the lights. Um, so this is how uh, a person would have experienced 
in Gamble House, this amount of light in the bedroom in the middle of the day, it was around somewhere, in some corners it was around 5 to 10 lux. And whereas if I have number 10, please, um, so in Bailey House, that middle of the spotlight is around 500 lux. That's actually dimmer than the dimmest place in that house. So with that, in keeping that in mind, now we can ask, if someone is living indoor 87 or 90% of the time and forget about the working people, now let's think about the children, the sick and then the elderly who spend more than 90% of the time indoor, then these light levels become extremely important as to how we can maintain their healthy lifespan, uh, mood, hormone level and circadian rhythm. Thank you.